Welcome to Warningham Rugby Football Club in Lipsfield Road. This film is to celebrate the centenary of the club that was formed in September 1922. A fascinating story from its origins and its connection with a club some miles away from here. How some friends got together to make the idea to form the club. How it grew from its original location to its current location, went from clubhouse to clubhouse went through the Second World War. There's a, a lot of tales to tell here, so join with me and learn about the history in the 100 years so far of Walling Rugby Football Club. So about the guys that formed the club, well, they were friends before the First World War. And they kind of got together again after the war. And one of them moved into the area, Mr. Slade, and he was followed a bit later by Mr. Skull. And when they got here, they kind of realized there wasn't a rug an open rugby football club in, in this neck of the woods. So they had some meetings and decided that there, there should be one. And it got some good support. They agreed, and it was all drawn up and minuted that the club would be formed and they would put out an advert for players to join. They arranged a fixture against Westminster Bank Crocs and through these adverts in the London press and other notices posted locally, they've got a total of 16 players, obviously enough to form a team. And the positions were arranged and they went out on the field and they won by a 50 point margin, which is an incredible first result. Now at that stage, they were known as Upper Wallingham Rugby Football Club. More about that later. Now, whilst I'm at the location of the current Wallingham Rugby Football Club, the first fixtures for the first few years were actually played at Wallingham Sports Club uh, over in Church Lane area. And the changing rooms and teas for the players were served in the village hall. So it was all quite close to move from there across to the location at, at Church Lane. The initial pitch was kind of prepared hastily by the guys, um, the volunteers at the time. The, the first set of goalposts were actually made by the builder that was building um, Mr. Skull's house. Uh, and he asked them to paint blue and white on the posts, and hence the kind of blue and white connection with these players that had started originally at Leightonstone. And the first season was a good season. Played 26, drawn 17, and lost nine. So that's a pretty good first performance. So in 1923-24 season, uh, one of the meetings, they said, we really should drop upper from the title of the club. Uh, and as locals know, there isn't really an upper Wallingham. And a quote at the time was, we're going to drop upper because no such place exists. So from that season, from 23-24 onwards, it's been known as Wallingham Rugby Football Club. And one of the pieces of history that we've got here is an extract from the fixture book of 1924-25 season. And I, I really like this because it kind of summarises everything you should need to know, even for the price of certain bits of kit. But you've got about the fact that a taxi will pick up the players from Upper Wallingham Station, who would have arrived on that specific train from London Bridge. Obviously, teas are served in the village hall, as mentioned earlier. And it was, uh, it was all kind of covered within that little booklet. Also, you see some of the results that have been written in there by hand. Fascinating piece of history in the story of the club. Up until 1928, Wallingham Sports Club over in Church Lane was the location where all the matches were played. And at that time, there was a review of the lease and Wallingham Sports Club were looking for the rugby club to be affiliated with themselves, which Wallingham Rugby Club didn't want to do. So it was a case then of looking for alternatives. And that's when this location here off Limpsfield Road became available. And Mr. Compton was the local farmer, I believe from Hamsey Green Farm. And he arranged to lease the land here. And really that was the start of the presence that still continues to this day. A clubhouse was built in the corner. Thanks to a generous donation from Arthur James Adam, who wanted to remain anonymous at the time, 
and more of Arthur Adams' story later. The Rugby Football Union provided a loan and its presence was secured. So this location is quite near Bats Farm, which is one of the many farms in Hamsey Green at the time. And there was a public footpath up past Bats Farm that led onto the field here. And actually it still exists as a public footpath. And it made sense to create the clubhouse in this location. In 1929, the clubhouse was extended. And in 1930, there was a new landowner for this particular land, which Wallingham Rugby Football Club had a, a lease on. And he wanted to sell up. So what to do? Well, after some discussion and some more contributions, notably also from Arthur James Adam, it was agreed to form a limited company and to purchase the ground outright. So in 1930, Wallingham Rugby Football Ground Limited was formed, incorporated as a company, and that secured the future, really the future to what we see today and hopefully for many years to come. I've mentioned the great name of Arthur James Adams a few times, but his story fascinated me because he was really key to the development and the investment in Wallingham Rugby Football Club. He was born in Blackheath in 1877. I don't know why he came to Wallingham. That's something I've not been able to find out, but he was a very successful businessman. He was a fruit broker or a fruit merchant. Uh, he had a company up at uh, Pudding Lane in London and his company, J&J Adam & Co, was one of the founder members of the London Fruit and Wool Exchange over at Spitalfields in London. So a very successful man. He became club president in 1932 and the last actual speech he gave at the club here was in the 1938-39 season. And shortly after then, he moved down to Sandbanks in Dorset, where he sadly passed away in 1946. Now, there is no known photograph of Arthur Adam, which is disappointing, really. So if you have a photo of Arthur James Adam, please share it. And then we can finally put his place on the wall. In terms of the war years, in 1938-39 there was a rather ominous approach from the air raid team or civil defence team to make use of the clubhouse and in that season, the 1938-39 season, the Times sent a photographer down to take pictures of a match against the Royal Tank Regiment and it's on the wall in the clubhouse along with many other photos from uh, the history of the club and sadly some players lost their lives during the war, giving their service for their country, and may they rest in peace. In terms of the land here, during the war the Surrey Agricultural Committee took it over, as it did with many places, many sort of playing fields or just non-used land, and it was turned over for agriculture and fruit production. Except for one pitch, they left one pitch near the clubhouse so there could be some play if possible during that time, during the war years. Now, at the end of the war, it was necessary to start legal proceedings to force the committee to put the land back to how it was, as used as a set of rugby pitches. And after some negotiations, uh, that, that went ahead, so Surrey Agricultural Committee agreed to fund the restoring of this land back to rugby club use. Well, unfortunately, in doing that, they ploughed up the very pitch that they'd retained. <laughs> so they just trashed the whole place. But eventually it was, uh, it was made good and um, rugby returned in the late 40s. There's quite a story to the club crest. There was actually a competition in the 1950s to design it there were a couple of different designs proposed so a competition was run and Mary Evans won the design so it's made up of the original colours the blue and white of Leightonstone it's got the English rose and it's got Surrey Castle at Guildford and put all those together you've got the badge that we see here 
that to this day relates to Wallingham RFC. There were quite a few events in the 1950s. There was a very unfortunate fire that took place on Saturday morning and the whole clubhouse, with the exception of the changing rooms, burnt down completely. And also there's a rather fascinating picture that emerged here of some guys outside the old clubhouse on a couple of scooters and a push bike, although that seems to have a number plate. Um, and, you know, if anyone knows these guys, please share it, because it would be useful to know as part of the story. One's holding a broom up in the air for some reason. What a great image of the time. The decision was taken to build a new clubhouse, but leave the changing rooms in the old building and build a new clubhouse here where we are now. In 1958, there were new changing rooms built here. And in 1965, there was a further purchase of land, giving the whole area the footprint that we have today. In 1967, a new bar was built. In 1972, there was the golden anniversary and a number of celebrations. And in 2005, a new clubhouse was built here over the top of what was already there from 1953. So this whole land that we see here is part of the new setup. And the new clubhouse was formally opened on the 18th of November 2005 by former England captain Martin Johnson. So in terms of the club today, it's thriving. Uh, they run a number of teams of different age groups. They're very involved in the community. There are beer festivals, music festivals, uh, classic car shows, weekly car boot sales, and the club like to be involved in other events that are taking place in the wider Wallingham area. You know, a lot has happened in that 100 years. The world's a very different place. But you know, with clubs like this doing such great work in the community, it's a real big positive uh, all the very best to you folk at Wallingham Rugby Football Club and here's to the next 100 years.